what, so, so far we have learned about the physiology and the pathophysiology, what causes it. Now what happens, what can make it worse? You have a patient heart failure, you treat it, but what makes them heart failure worse? So they keep on coming back. Reduction, therapy of poor compliance. Either you did not give the right medication or the patient is not taking it. You say every day, instead of every day, he, uh, we will just take it one every day because it's too expensive. I'll take one tablet today, very common I'll find in Pakistan. The doctor describes six things, I decide to take three today and three tomorrow. You're defeating the purpose. You have a, taking a high salt, our food is very, very salty. Everything is so salty, you take salt, you, you retain salt, you retain water, heart failure worse. And because irregular heartbeat may occur, arrhythmias, tachyarrhythmias, bradyarrhythmias, arrhythmia, because the heart is already damaged, so it started irritating. You may have some systemic infection. You may have physical or environmental or emotional stress. It's too cold or too hot or too humid. Or too, got angry. I said, did you have a, a problem with your wife and you got up in the morning? That's what I asked my patient. And which side of the bed did you come up? And, and that's what probably what happened. Your heart rate went fast because they insist, oh, I didn't take salt, I didn't take anything at all. And then what happened? In, in, a, in a sort of light mode, that's what you can ask them. What about the pulmonary embolism? Because you have a venous uh, already pooling in the leg and the patient may be lying down, not moving. That's the uh, classical setting for thrombus to occur and then for pulmonary embolism. Or patient is not hypertension right now. Wasn't that much, now it's much more because it's not working, it's sodium retention. Cardiac inflammation, infection inflammation. That may be one of the reasons to start with. Or high output stage, very high output, such as hyperthyroidism such as aortic regurgitation, coronary AV fistula, all these conditions may be heart, uh, or even cirrhotic, so, uh, so some of the uh, liver cirrhosis, the 30, 40% patients with uh, cardiac cirrhosis may have a very high cardiac output. Or new unrelated illness, and finally, new form of heart disease, because they had a cardiomyopathy, but they are also now 75 years old, may have developed a coronary artery disease as well on top of it. What about the clinical characteristic of comorbid conditions? There are quite a few are listed on age and others. I'm not going to go over it, but all I'm telling you in this, from this slide, that the definitely all other conditions make the heart failure worse, such as diabetes mellitus, diastolic blood pressure, coronary artery disease, and history of uh, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Everything would make the heart failure worse because they are on top of it. Same thing, uh, continue atrial fibrillation, make the heart failure worse. Atrial flutter, supraventricular tachyarrhythmia, hypothyroidism. If you have patient of uh, anemia, especially hemoglobin less than 11.6, you have a kidney function, gl uh, glomerular filtration rate or creatinine, abnormal. Patient on dialysis, if the patient is too heavy, you have a body mass index. All these things are considered comorbid to make the heart failure worse. Now, in terms of the hypertrophy by itself, and as this slide shows, left ventricular hypertrophy on the ECG, on the EKG or the ECG, on the wall thickness, on the total left ventricular mass, and everything adds on to the heart failure. As it says, left ventricular mass was calculated in this case, while calculated using some equation which is not important for this particular lecture, but I'm just saying it the LVH becomes hypertrophied initially because of increased afterload, and that adds further to the... Uh, uh. What about the neurohumoral model I just gave you, alluded to in one slide, where the um, uh, other mechanism also uh, come into play, especially with chronic heart failure. That's become very important. Right now, you can see the decreased renal perfusion will lead to renin formation, will lead to angiotensin, and all these system, system become also crucial for this uh, chronic decompensated heart failure. This also just shows, again, the same thing. I'm going to bypass it because basically it just tells you this is not only in terms of the arrhythmia, but also, I mean, in terms of the heart failure, but also they also lead to the arrhythmia formation because of anion cation transport at the cellular level. Same thing in the heart failure. Right now, you can see it's a vicious circle. Cardiac dysfunction, you have a remodeling, you have a cellular responses, you have a, a molecular uh, uh, body dynamics. Everything then becomes uh, involved, neurohumoral and all other system. 
get very seriously haywire. Now, again, this was the, in the uh, just demographic I'm showing you in case of the uh, total the heart failure. The ejection fraction was considered uh, one of the main parameters of the pump function. It, pr ejection fraction is really a stroke volume divided by end diastolic volume. How much it comes out, how much blood is there. This is called ejection fraction. How much blood is being ejected per stroke volume. And ejection fraction is a beautiful parameter of measuring the heart pump function, not the muscle function. What's saying is some people, very interestingly, those, especially older female, when they came in heart failure, their ejection fraction was normal. Why on earth is that? Why should patient go into heart failure with a normal ejection fraction? Answer it as you grow older. Also, especially in female, and right now you can see many studies have shown, this is called heart failure preserved or low ejection fraction. As you grow older, the more and more are coming, especially in the Western society, I can't tell from here, but I don't know the statistics, they keep on coming with that preserved ejection fraction because of a problem with the compliance, because of the stiffness of the heart. And the major thing happening is a diastolic dysfunction, not in the systolic. And here is the com comparison, systolic versus diastolic congestive heart failure. In systolic, you can see the heart size is markedly, markedly increased. In diastole, the heart size is not increased. Is there anything else is slightly thicker. Left ventricular ejection fraction, sometimes in, uh, in systole is markedly depressed. But in diastole, it, it may be normal, it may be slightly decreased, or maybe up even. I have seen patients an 85-year-old who will come with an ejection fraction of 80%, but is still in heart failure because of the diastole, because the pressure increases in diastole, it reflects into the left atrium, back into the pulmonary system. Here is the problem. Left ventricular compliance in systolic heart failure is decreased mildly or maybe not affected. But in diastole, look at markedly. Left ventricular diastolic pressure may be higher, but indefinitely much, much higher in case of diastolic heart failure. LV diastolic volume is markedly increased because the heart is dilated. In diastolic heart failure, the heart may, may be normal, may be slightly decreased, or may be mildly increased. LV thickness is actually very thin wall dilated cardiomyopathy, but in diastolic heart failure, it's significantly increased, sometimes very, very significantly increased. As a result of an auscultation, S3 is usually present because of the dilated heart, but in diastole, may, may not. But look at the S4, and that's a very, very significant differentiating feature. If somebody comes to you with heart failure, an older person, and you hear an S4, then you can tell possibly the ejection fraction is normal, and this is the diastolic heart failure in contrast to uh, absent, in contrast to S3, which will be absent in this case. What happened to the left ventricular function with congestive heart failure? What happens? If you have a myocardial disease, this is localized, myocardial infarction occurred, this is the primary phase because this part is damaged, like we saw in a case uh, today in uh, rounds. The young man had an anterior wall infarction with involvement of the septum, but later, what would happen in the second phase, the cardiac would adopt. This is called remodeling. The inferior wall on the other side may dilate, and you may end up either with systolic or diastolic dysfunction. And you may have clinical congestive heart failure or either low cardiac output or heart output failure. Let's look at this one here. We generalize. This was the localized. If you have a generalized, such as the congestive cardiomyopathy, you have start with heart normal. Right now, it's got dilated. You have a systolic abnormal function. Diastolic function may not, may, may not be abnormal. But here, definitely showing abnormal, and so forth. So over, this is overloading. This is myocardial disease. Same thing happened. It keeps on progressing, as you, you will recall that as we were discussing how one parameter becomes abnormal, but the other two follow abnormally. 